Echo Fund is have the fun. There we go. So good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Jesse. And I am with Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants. For those who don't know, we're all about bringing conservation, adventure, and science into classrooms around the world. Right now, we are joined by three classes from across North America. I'm going to give them a chance to do a bit of a shout out before we go straight to the, to the hangout. Uh, we've got Miss Grace 1112s in Bellevue in Washington. Hi, guys. Hi, everyone. All right. I know their mic isn't working, but they are there and they are excited. We've got Miss Haney's grade fives in Mississauga, Ontario. Hi, guys. Hi, there we go. And we've got Miss Dernan's grade tens in Clinton, Ontario, that just joined us a minute ago. Hello. Hi. Guys. Hi. <laughs> Right. Of course, the reason you guys are all here today is for our speakers. We are joined live in the middle of the ocean by the RV research vessel Falfor, part of the Schmidt Ocean Institute. They do many, many hangouts with us and do amazing research on board their vessel. We're joined by the principal investigator, Anna, and grad student Izzy out there, who are going to tell us a little bit about their work hunting bubbles in the ocean. So without further ado, take it away, ladies. Thanks so much for joining us. Hi everybody, I'm Anna Michelle and I am an associate scientist at the Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution, which is located um, in Massachusetts. And I'm joined today with one of our amazing graduate students, uh, Izzy Baker. Hi everyone, I'm Izzy Baker. I'm a graduate student getting my PhD at Harvard University. So we're actually going to show you some slides to kind of show you what we've been doing and then we'll open it up to questions. But we just wanted to make sure everybody knew what we've been doing out here. Um, so you have some good questions in mind. So we're going to flip now to the slides. There we go. So we are we are out here on a ship called the Falcor. Right now we are basically off the coast of California. We've been working off the coast of Oregon. We're on our way to San Francisco uh, to actually get off the ship uh, later this week. So the Falcor is a research ship that goes all around um, the world and right now is working in the Pacific. This is the ROV that we've been using. Uh, the ROV's name is Sebastian. Uh, the thing about using an ROV is it lets us get to deep parts of the ocean so that we can make measurements, we can take samples, we can see what's down there. On the front of the vehicle, or the most important parts of the vehicle, are these two arms, these manipulators. What they can do is they can be used to pick up samples, they can be used to take push cores, take sediment samples, we can use them to turn on engineering instrumentation, we can use them to move around things in the ocean floor. They're really the most important part um, of the vehicle. So they're our hands when we're, when we're diving in the, deep, in the deep ocean. We've also been using another important piece of equipment on this cruise. This is a CTD rosette. Each one of those gray tubes is actually a bottle. What we do is we put this over the side using a winch. We lower it down through the water column. Those bottles are actually open and when we get to a certain depth of water, we actually can trigger it to close it, and we can grab water from different depths in the ocean. This is important because it lets us actually understand the water at different depths, um, which can tell us about the chemistry, the physical oceanography, even the biology of what's happening throughout the water column. So we've been doing a cruise called Hunting Bubbles. We've been looking for uh, methane in the deep ocean. So methane comes from lots of different sources, and the reason it's important to study overall is because it contributes to climate change. So methane actually comes from all these different environments, such as landfills, comes from estuaries, uh, where we grow rice and rice paddies. It also comes from the cows that when they fart. <laughs> but we've been looking at methane in this deep ocean environment. So we've been looking at these methane bubbles that come out of the deep ocean. So what you see here um, is a stream of bubbles. And we've been actually trying to make measurements of these bubbles. What happens though is that these, the, where we're working is very high pressure and it's also very cold. When we get these conditions just in alignment, we actually have the methane gas turn to this ice-like structure. So it kind of looks like a snow cone, what you're seeing. It's actually called a methane hydrate and it's this ice-like structure. So it's very difficult when we to actually measure it because as soon as it touches something like a funnel, it turns into this ice-like structure. So here's just a picture of one of the environments we've been working in. You see all that white mass out there. That's actually microbial mat, and Izzy will be telling us a bit more about that um, throughout the talk. Um, this kind of looks like one of the environments we've been working in. So I'm going to turn it over to Izzy now, who's going to tell us about some of the amazing biology that we've seen. Thanks, Anna. Uh, so here we see uh, one of my favorite samples. This was something we collected the very first day of the cruise. Um, so 
Believe it or not, even though there's tons of methane around, there are tons of animals and bacteria that thrive in these kinds of environments. Part, this is partly because the bacteria are able to uh, transform the methane into carbon dioxide. This creates lots of cool microenvironments that bring lots of other bacteria in that make lots of other important elements biologically available for use which then brings in the larger creatures like this giant crab. When I held this crab up uh, to about my neck, from, the, from there, with its legs dangling, it was about uh, two-thirds length of my body. Right here, we're showing a push core being sampled. So a push core is a plastic sleeve um, that we bring down, and we use it to collect sediment from the ocean. So from the seafloor of the ocean. So when you push this core into the ground, it uh, creates a little bit of a vacuum, it pulls the sediment up. And I've been using these push cores to study the uh, microbial communities in the sediment. And what's really cool with some of these sediments is they have a very stark change in color. It's because only the very top few centimeters have access to oxygen. Everything below that has zero oxygen and it brings lots of cool bacteria in that are doing lots of interesting things such as oxidizing methane, turning it to carbon dioxide. Here we have um, a very interesting looking sea anemone. We've been seeing lots of weird creatures around. This sea anemone was especially interesting because it appeared on the shell of a snail. We've also been seeing lots of these fish. Um, on, in the back of the picture, what I find especially interesting is something called an octocoral. Octocorals are very close relatives of jellyfish. They're called octocorals because each one of their tentacles has eightfold symmetry. And here we have a gorgeous ray. We've been seeing tons of these. Um, they will go from being absolutely sedentary to the point where you think they might be dead and will all of a sudden lift up off the ground like a UFO and start flying, swimming around. Here's that crab again. You'll notice it has all these little white uh, strings on it. Those are most likely worms that are uh, experiencing a mutualistic relationship with this crab, just along for the ride, getting any of the leftovers from what the crab might be eating and being able to use the crab as, as a free bus. Here we have another beautiful coral. Uh, this one was especially uh, unique in not just the size, but the beautiful spiral patterning. And here's a sea urchin. Uh, we've been seeing lots of these as well. Sea urchins are actually very close relatives of uh, sea stars and sea cucumbers. Uh, they're part of a group called the echinoderms, which are actually quite closely re related to humans <laughs> in the grand scheme of things. Here we have some more sea stars. We've been seeing an amazing diversity of sea stars uh, at our sites. Some of them have five legs, some have 10 legs, some have very small inner bodies with very long legs or vice versa. Um, sea stars are amazing because you would think they'd be quite still creatures, but thanks to these very tiny tentacles they have on the bottom of their bodies, they're able to move quite quickly. Here's another uh, amazing variety of sea star we've seen. You can see some of those tentacles I was referring to by looking at the very bottom at the uh, lower left of the slide. You can see these little white uh, appendages sticking out. Those are those tentacles. Here we have a squid. Uh, we've been seeing some squid in the area. They've been really exciting to see. Squids are invertebrates. Um, contrary to what a lot of people think, they are close relatives to, to uh, mollusks like snails and things of that nature. And here we have a gorgeous jellyfish or sea jelly. Um, we Jellies are really amazing because they are, evolutionarily speaking, relatively old creatures, and yet they dominate the sea floor all the way up to the uh, sea surface. And here we have a cute sea cucumber. Again, these are close relatives of sea urchins and sea stars and broadly close relatives of humans as well. Sea cucumbers are amazing because they can literally extrude their entire digestive system to make the most of any nutrients they see around. So what you're seeing with those white appendages in the very front that look like branching structures is part of its digestive system. 
sea cucumbers are really cool as well because they act as filtering systems for the sea floor. They usually scooch along the sea floor eating sand, filter out all the nutrients and good stuff for them, and then out the other end comes the cleaned out sand. We've also been extremely fortunate to see some uh, sharks. We believe they've been mako sharks. Uh, they've been extremely curious whenever the they find the ROV. Uh, they've come extremely close to the ROV at times, which has been very cool, and they've even uh, displayed some circular swimming patterns that you might only see in movies. So all of you have probably gone to science class this week, or in science class right now. I'm sure some of you have also gone to art class this week. So. What, one very interesting part of this cruise is that we brought an artist out with us. This is Adam Swanson, who was out for the first part of this cruise. And he actually drew, painted a lot of pictures of what we were actually seeing. He painted pictures of the ship and some of the underwater scenes. And I like to show this picture because it shows that not only do we have scientists out here, um, we also have artists. So it's a very diverse group of people that are out on the ship. So if you're interested in um, other aspects um, of ship life, there's lots of different people out here. And so again, what we've been doing is looking at these bubble environments. We've been studying what's in the bubbles, where do the bubbles go, but we've also been studying the animals and trying to understand how they actually live in these environments that have all these bubbles. So we're going to turn it over now to questions. There we go. Well, thank you guys for that presentation. Such neat animals you guys have been finding. Uh, all right, we'll start with Miss Gray's class. Actually, Miss Gray, I don't think your mic was working. If it is, you'll be good to go. And if it isn't, then you can pass along questions written online and I'll, I'll forward them to the full court. Are you guys good? Is the mic working or not? I don't think so. Okay, so type them in and then we'll come back to you guys in just a minute. Uh, we'll start then with Miss Haney's class. If you guys have a question, go for it. Any questions? What did we miss? What did we miss? Unfortunately, we had some technical difficulties and we missed the first half of your presentation. That's okay. Oh, sorry. Okay. Well, in that case, we will come back in a minute. Do you guys have any questions though about the half that you did see or not? Okay. Any questions? Um, Okay. Mohammed? Oh. Yep. Go for it. I want to know if you can turn the presentation back on so that we can see. Oh, we'll go back and watch it after, okay? Yeah, we yeah. have it on YouTube, guys. You can watch it from there and then we can follow up in a little bit. Uh, that's okay. Uh, we'll head. So the question from Ms. Gray's class is how deep does the ROV go, guys? That's a great question. So on this cruise, we were working what I would call shallow environments. So we were working up to about 800 meters, which um, may sound really, really deep to you, but sometimes we actually work in much deeper environments, like 4,000 meters. And so the ROV can go anywhere from about 100 meters. We don't like to work shallower than that. Um, to, I think the deepest this one goes is probably 4,500 meters. Um, but this one, I think we were working pretty shallow because we were working on 800 meters. But if you think about how big 800 meters is, it's pretty, pretty deep. Yeah. Awesome. All right. Let's go to Ms. Right. You guys have a question? Go for it. Yep. Clinton, you guys are good. Three ten. Okay. Good. <laughs> um, how many people are on the ship? That's a great question. So right now we have 41 people on the ship. And if you think about who's actually on the ship, there are a team of scientists. I think there's 10 or 11 of us scientists on the ship. There's also a whole ROV team. So the ROV pilots, um, people that take care of the ROV. But then we have everybody else who takes care of our daily life. So we have the captain and the, and the officers who drive the ship. We have um, people that cook the, the lunch. We have people that that clean the ship. We have all sorts of people. We've got the people that run the engine. So there's a huge diversity of people on the ship who come from all over the world and work on different tasks. And everybody works together um, to get the science done. Okay. Second question from Ms. Grace class is, do you only study the deep ocean? Is there any shallow water work you do or is it all deep? That's a great question. So I, my, my, personally in my lab, we do both. We study the shallow ocean and the deep ocean. And actually on this cruise, we were working in very shallow water. We were working in an area that was 
40 to 100 meters. Um, we were interested in seeing if any of those bubbles came to the surface. So if any of you go online and look at the ship track, you'll see an area that we worked in with very, very tight track lines. And that was because we were working in this shallow area looking for new uh, plumes. And that was because we wanted to deploy this surface vehicle. So imagine a kayak that can drive itself. Um, that's what we had out in that shallow environment. Um, I also work, when I'm back home, we also work in some coastal environments. Izzy, do you do any non-deep ocean work? Um, yeah, actually, very recently, I just started working with some um, extremely shallow water samples from off the coast of Hawaii, uh, looking at iron oxidizing bacteria. These are bacteria that get their energy by causing iron to rust. Very cool. All right. Uh, another question. So, Miss Haney's class, if you guys do have any questions, I know you missed some of the presentation. Think of them, uh, and I'll come back to you guys in just a minute. Uh, I do want to pass along another question from Miss Bray's class, which is, Izzy, what are you doing your PhD in? Great question. I'd like to know that myself. <laughs> um, I My PhD is officially in um, organismic and evolutionary biology, but more specifically, I study these bacteria that are capable of changing the chemistry of their environments. I'm really interested in this because bacteria that can do these kinds of things have a really big impact on the habitability of certain parts of uh, the world and have big implications for the habitability of potentially other worlds. Um, the bacteria I mentioned earlier, iron oxidizing bacteria, are especially interesting to me. Iron is one of the most biologically important elements on Earth after carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, and uh, phosphorus and sulfur. Iron is also one of the most important geological elements on Earth, making up most of the rocks on Earth. Um, the fact that these bacteria are capable of changing the redox states of iron, meaning whether or not it will uh, react with certain things, is a really big deal when we're thinking about distributions of oxygen and other biologically important elements on Earth. So I'm interested in studying these bacteria not just to get a better understanding of how they're changing the habitability of current places on Earth, like methane seeps, but also to get a better idea of how they might have changed the habitability of early Earth and potentially on other planets, if there is life on other planets. You should get involved with Three Minute Thesis. That was like the best description off the cuff of a PhD I've ever heard. Um, oh, well done. <laughs> so let's try Ms. Haney's class. If you guys have any questions about the deep sea, about the work that the ship does, feel free to ask. Important message Five, four, three, two. Okay. Do we have Go back to Miss Dernan's class. You guys have a question. Okay. Go for it. How long are you on the ship for? That's a great question. So Izzy and I have actually been out on the ship since August 24th. Uh, we will come into port tomorrow. So it'll have been about a month that we've been on the ship. Um, we did have something called a mid-cruise transfer where we came in close to the shore. And some people got off the ship and some people got on. That way we could have more um, scientists involved with the cruise. Um, some of our students had to go back to the university. Um, and we had um, just some different science we were doing in the second part of the ship. But Izzy and I have been on the ship for about a month. So we are almost ready to go home. Yes. Are you going on more expeditions later this year? Or are you back on shore for a month and then back on the boat? Or how does it work? So I have a nine-year-old son who, if I tell him I'm leaving for another month, will not be happy. So I am going to stay on shore um, for the rest of this year. Hopefully I'll be back out at sea at some point next year. Um, Izzy, do you have any more trips this year? I don't have any more plans for the coming year, although most of my lab will be on the Falcor uh, just a few days after we arrive in San Francisco for a cruise looking at uh, – the Abyss Lander, which we've been working on a little bit on this cruise, which is uh, something sponsored by NASA to help monitor deep sea environments. All right, we got a question from Miss Gray's class, which is, did you find anything unexpected? Very broad. That's a great question. So um, I'll get Izzy to talk a little bit about the biology we found, but um, one thing we were, when I was talking about this shallow stuff, we were really interested in seeing if we could find any shallow sticks. And we explored an area that the best of my knowledge, um, I haven't seen anybody find seeps in that area before. I haven't fully looked, but um, we were surprised at how many how many um, bubble sites we found in that area. Um, I think the other thing that we found, although other people have found this before, is how the bubble plumes would suddenly be on. They'd be streaming like a big geyser of bubbles, and then they would just shut off. 
and the bubbles would just be gone until the next day when suddenly they would turn back on. And that to me was probably the most surprising thing, even though other people report this, to actually see it was very surprising to me. Izzy, you want to say anything about any of the interesting biology we found? Sure. Um, so, so following on that tangent about um, the bubbles, something especially surprising was the fact that these bubbles created these little pock marks in the sand, in the sediment. This, this aspect was not surprising. It had been known for a long time. But what I found especially surprising was to see that in some of these more extinct bubble plume sites where the, where the holes had remained, they were completely colonized by bacteria and um, small animals, especially shrimp, that had kind of made these little holes their new homes. Um, another especially uh, surprising thing that I found were uh, not just how low the oxygen got as you got closer to these methane bubble sites, but the fact that there may be iron oxidizing bacteria in these sites. I Every chance we had with the ROV at the seafloor, uh, I asked uh, Dr. Michelle and the ROV pilots to slurp up anything disgusting they saw. So anytime they saw something that looked like rotten cheese or um, moldy bread, I said, oh, I want that. Please bring it up. And they used something called a slurp sampler, which literally would vacuum it up. I'd bring it up and I'd try to incubate it with um, special types of iron to see if things would grow. And lo and behold, we did have some things grow at some of these sites. I like how science has become slurp up that disgusting bit down there. That's amazing. Um, exactly. <laughs> Izzy, so uh, for the grade 11 and 12 students especially who will be entering university soon, how does someone end up with an opportunity like this? How did you end up on the boat? How did you, I mean, I know you're PhD students, so you're further along, but how did that process unfold? That's a great question. So the big piece of advice I give to most people is to be um, to be a pest. <laughs> so um, even starting in high school, I had the amazing opportunity to work in a lab, and that was because I annoyed um, the heck out of a lot of different scientists in my area. I emailed nonstop. I just really wanted to see what a lab looked like, and then once someone finally let me uh, it was all downhill from there, <laughs> where I was able to keep annoying them until they let me come in and shadow a graduate student. And um, just that opportunity was was honestly life changing because I saw how cool science could be. Then in college, same story in university. I just kept annoying people over and over until they let me come visit them and 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 uh, start doing things in their lab. Um, I did not ever think I'd be on a boat as part of my career, um, or a ship rather. Um, uh, but I, uh, I have been very open to any opportunity that's come my way and um, have tried to be very open to all different kinds of science. I originally wanted to be a medical doctor, then I wanted to study stem cells. Now I'm studying uh, disgusting bits of crud on the bottom of the ocean floor, and I couldn't be happier. <laughs> Um, so I think the most important thing is to uh, keep yourself open to opportunities. Take lots of different classes, even if they're classes and things that you think you might not be interested in, you will definitely surprise yourself. And um, persistence is key. Be as annoying as possible awesome. to your professors and teachers. And to friends sometimes. And to friends sometimes. And friends too. All right. All right. Let's check in Let's with... Check in with uh, sir. You guys have a question. Go right ahead. Anyone, Mr. Inspos? Come back. Uh, do you have any veterinarians on board in South Florida? No, we do not. Um, I think any veterinarians on board would be very upset uh, with some of the things we've been doing. Um, we've been doing everything very ethically when we work with animals, um, but. Uh, I don't think we've been um, encountering any animals that we could potentially help. We haven't, we've been, I don't think we've seen any especially sick animals or anything like that. Um, but I do know there are marine uh, veterinarians out in the world that work on things like, uh, especially marine mammals like whales, uh, dolphins, and animals like that. Ms. Haney's class, do you guys have any questions? I mean, what does? Yes. Someone has a hand up. Um, can methane kill people or kill animals? They're really quite a great question. So 
the environment where there's lots of methane, we actually see there's a lot of biology. There's a lot of animals living there. Um, what we actually saw one day, which we found very interesting, and I think the video is probably on our website under one of the highlights, um, we actually saw this bubble stream, and we watched this crab actually walk over to the bubble stream, sit down in the bubble stream, and then it started what looked like eating the methane bubbles. And it was very interesting to watch. What we actually think was happening was that it wasn't eating them, but the crab was really dirty, and you'll see that if you watch the video. was lots of stuff growing on the crab. We think it was actually using the methane to feed the bacteria that was on the crab. And then, it, so it was using it to have kind of a symbiotic relationship because um, it was kind of pushing the methane onto it. We're not entirely sure that was what was happening, but that's sort of our best um, guess. So it seemed like that crab really, really liked living in the methane. Um, there's some other environments like brine pools that you find in places like the Gulf of Mexico that are, have its really, really high methane concentration. They're also really, really, really salty. And the animals that fall in there tend to die. And so I'm not sure exactly what it is that's killing those animals, but those animals seem to be smart enough to just kind of stay away from that very that brine area. Um, but this area, they seem the animals seem very happy to live in the methane environment, and they adapted ways to live in these environments. So check out that video. I'm not sure which week the, the which video it is online, but check out that crab if you're trying to uh, move the methane bubbles around. It was really cool to watch. Week two, I'm being told. Check out week two video. Uh, it's worth noting to all the classes, actually. So the Falcor has some amazing resources online. There's an like, incredible website. You guys have tons of learning opportunities. So if anyone wants to follow up with more, learn anything about the other expeditions, they can. I also, before I go to another question, want to mention, uh, if you want to see that methane seep on the bottom of the ocean, Blue Planet 2 has this like lake on the bottom of the ocean. It's one of the best videos you'll ever see. It's one of the best bits of natural history documentary ever. So do look that up, uh, Blue Planet 2. And then let's go back to Miss Haney's class. I don't know if you guys have any more questions, but we can try. Do you want to say it? No. Can you tell Taha he'll say it? Okay. We have one, but it's a shy student, so he's having a friend ask. <laughs> have you seen fossils? I'm sorry, we didn't. Yeah. Have we seen fossils? Yes. Yeah, okay. Have we seen fossils? I don't think we've seen any fossils on this uh, cruise at all. We have collected some rocks. We have a geologist on the ship right now who's really interested in the geology of these environments. Um, I actually have a whole bunch of rocks right here. Um, I don't know if you can see them. I'll bring it close to the camera. Um, so we have been collecting some rocks so that we can understand uh, the geology, but um, so far, we have not seen any fossils. Okay, we'll have to save that for next time. Next expedition, Fossils 2020. Um, <laughs> all right, guys, before we wrap, that's very cool. Before we wrap up the Hangout, uh, is there anything else you'd like to tell us about your expedition? Any way people can follow and learn more? Any last thoughts? Um, definitely check out our Hunting Bubbles website on uh, Schmidt Ocean Institute's page. Um, we're doing lots of interesting science. Um, I definitely want to reiterate that if you're interested in science or being a veterinarian or being an artist, um, there are lots of different ways that you can come to see and help make an important impact on the health of our world. Definitely just uh, reach out to anyone you might know that is involved in these kinds of things. Go to the local port um, and definitely bug your professors and teachers. Yeah, I'd also like to add to that, um, following our cruise, there's another cruise starting in about two weeks, I think, uh, followed by several more cruises this year. And if you're really interested, you can watch those live on YouTube, and there's actually a chat, so you can send in your questions directly to the scientists and ROV team who are there. And so if you have questions as those are going on, that's a great way to get them answered and, and to see what, um, you're actually seeing what, the same thing that we're seeing, which I think is pretty cool, so you can be kind of like a scientist ashore uh, while the scientists on the ship are are doing the science. So I would encourage you to check out those future cruises. Very cool. And of course, from exploring by the seat of your pants, we'll be having more hangouts all year long with you guys. So with the Thalacor, with other research vessels, uh, and many, many more this month of ocean plastic as well, which we're really focusing on. So please do check those out as well. Uh, guys, what we do at the end of every hangout is I'm going to demute everyone's microphone. So Miss Gray's class, Miss Haney's class, Miss Jordan's class. If you could join me in saying a big thank you to the RV Thalacor team. Thank you, guys. Thank you.
Awesome. We look forward to having you all back soon. Bye. Thank you. Bye.